But apparently, if I fancy getting married anytime soon, you're available for that too, right? So, apparently, you know. the world's greatest uh, <laughs> officiant is available. If you can find a woman who will marry you, Mustafa, uh, but you got a start up. <laughs> you, oh, you already got that accomplished? <laughs> no, no, I'm struggling with that. I'm very much sing- single. So, I mean, if you want to marry me to my You're startup not single. collection. You, you, you are married, <laughs> married to your startup. I, you raised literally. a billion dollars. I can tell you who you're married to for the next 10 years. Absolutely. <laughs> Inflection AI and your 40 people over there. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Open Phone brings your team's business calls, texts, and contacts into one delightful app that works anywhere. Get 20% off your first six months at openphone.com slash twist. Crowdbotics, great ideas can change the world. And Crowdbotics is the fastest way to turn those ideas into code. Get a free scoping session for your next big app idea at crowdbotics.com slash twist. And Carta now lets you launch and administer SPVs for your syndicate. Share your knowledge, capital, and network to launch your syndicate SPVs through Carta. Get 10% off your first SPV at carta.com slash twist with promo code twist. All right, we got a big treat for you today on This Week in Startups. Mustafa Suleiman is here. He's with Inflection AI, but uh, very famous for having been the co-founder of DeepMind. Welcome to the program, Mustafa. Great to be here. Thank you, JC. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Uh, you know, I wanted to start with the origins of DeepMind because it seems like so much of what we're seeing in AI stands on the shoulders uh, of that organization. And I, th- I don't think most people know the history of it. I happen to know a little bit of the history of it because I remember when Peter Thiel and Elon, I think, were two of the early funders of it and we're talking about it. And we met, I think, at a couple of different industry events over time. Tell me, wh- what was the origin of DeepMind? Uh, and then how did it, uh, you know, originate and, and start to tackle AI, general AI, vertical AI, all these different um, things that are coming to fruition. And I guess that was 2010, right? 2011? It was 2010 that we started the company. Yeah, exactly. Which seems yeah. kind of insane, like almost 15 years ago. And it, it it's just quite surreal to see because in the last sort of, what is it, nine to 12 months, it feels like the kind of large language model revolution has come out of nowhere um, and exploded onto the scene. But in fact, it has been the kind of steady march of many, many years and a huge amount of failure and a lot of risk and a lot of persistence that I often think gets slightly neglected in the story Mm -hmm. of the perfect explosion of a new technology. Um, You know, in fact, um, you know, for most of the last decade, we didn't have language models. I mean, the transformer mm. was really only popularized in 2017. I mean, people often say that it was invented then. It was certainly not invented then. It was invented a good 15 or 20 years earlier by Oshua Bengio. And then many other people developed the ideas, but um, it was really only, uh, you know, four or five years ago that the idea started to get traction again. And then it wasn't until GPT-3 that people started to get a glimpse of you know, what it looked like at scale instead of just in a test environment. So yeah, it's been a crazy journey. Um, how do we start the company? So 2010, um, I was actually playing poker with Demis mm. uh, Hasabis, who is my longtime friend since we were uh, quite a bit younger. Um, in at- London, I assume, at those high-rate casinos? Hard rooms? <laughs> That's right. It was at the Victoria Casino in yeah. London, which is on Edgware Road um not the biggest game in the world i i seem to remember it was probably a 250 pound tournament only 120 people but you know um so we would play at these things regularly um both of us were very passionate about poker i was pe- mm. playing i was i was i was one of these people that was doing like eight table poker stars yeah uh, back in the day mm. um my friends were doing 16 table but i didn't have the uh, actions per minute speed to be able to manage that you're you're on a clock. Yeah, it's it's not easy to multi table. Uh, although it's something about multi tabling becomes like a flow experience. And you start to see patterns, right? Because you're playing so fast, that you yeah. have no choice but to kind of play instinct, right? right. Um, and now it seems like GTO and all these theories are people are able to really deploy it very quickly. I, I hate online poker. I like in person because I can the only edge I have is my ability to read people. 
which is such well, that, a critical part of the game. And it's so hard to, for me to read people online. It's also the fun part of the game, right? Like yes. pushing people off parts and teasing people yeah. for their losses. I mean, that's that's the fun part. Like so, yeah. But I mean, getting through a lot of hands is also a very great way to practice. I mean, because you end up developing heuristics, and so you yep. just see. That's the problem. Is it's such a high variance game in your career? If you only ever play live, you never get to see the volume, which gives you the range of experiences. Mm. So the good thing about really a, having a short stint of abusing online poker is that you just get to see depth and breadth, which which yes. is which is cool. But you can pick up bad habits because it can make you too cautious. Ah, interesting. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't heard that before. So you don't is that is the reason you get too cautious is because everybody's reading each other's like statistics and you're just like i'm going to be too easy to read here i can't make a non-traditional play i'm going to get caught yeah because uh, because everybody sees so much more volume then then they play in a much more predictable and structured way so you yes. learn to predict everybody else's moves and you know also they end up being because they see more volume they are more deliberate with their hands and more cautious whereas in a home game you may only see a couple hundred hands, even in a six to eight hour yeah. game, right? And so you, you, your range is clearly much lower. You, you're playing cards that you would otherwise leave behind because you're seeing more throughput online, yeah. right? So, you know, the classic is the knit. You know, we used to call them the knits when they would come yeah. to the, the live tables and they'd like clearly just playing this robotic game and driving themselves nuts because they weren't seeing enough volume. It's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah, it's, 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 it's such a fascinating game. And playing live in a casino, you get to see like a real broad spectrum of humanity. I was just talking to somebody about my friend Sky Dayton and I used to play at Hollywood Park and Commerce uh, in LA. And we would play at the lowest tables. And at one point, I was trying to figure out how to read people better. And I came up with the idea of Jedi poker, uh, where I would pull my cards up, and put my thumb on it. But I'd make a bit of a show of looking at my cards. But I would have them covered. So I didn't know what cards I had, Mustafa. That's the and best then way. <laughs> I would only play the person. And right. I'd be like, this person seems very strong. This person seems pretty scared. Let me see if I can get this person off the hand. Let me see. And then I would get to the river and I would literally, if somebody called me down, <laughs> I would turn over my cards and be embarrassed, like, oh, I have a set. I didn't know it. Or I had bottom pair. And they'd be like, How would you bet like that? It makes no sense. And making no sense is part of poker. Because you it, have to break the ability for people to be able to read you. A hundred percent. This is my, one of my favorite ways of doing it. The other way I like to do it is to represent a hand off the flop that I don't mm. have, ah. assuming that it is the opposite hand or a better hand than the, whatever I place that person on. So, mm. you know, that, that's actually a very good way of doing it because then you bet consistently across the three, you know, uh, Street. steps. Street. Yeah. But you... Um, but you know, so you're not being ridiculous and wacky. You, but you're telling a story. You're representing. You've convinced a narrative. yourself that you have ten jack, and when the board comes down, you right. know nine king queen. You're like, I've, I'm playing ten jack, and I'm going right. to play it like ten jack would play this. Yeah, you just got to make sure you know how to lay down if your opponent actually ends up having the hand that you're trying to represent. That, yeah. that can get pretty sticky. But yeah, are you still using your personal phone number for your startup? It's 2023. It's time to stop. It is a huge mistake that founders make. Why? You're just getting started with your company and you don't think about phone numbers as being an important part of the IP collection of your startup. With open phone, you can totally solve this problem. They've rethought everything about a modern business phone and how it should work. It's super easy. You just download the app on your phone or your desktop and uh, you pick a number and you're done. And you do it for just such a low price. It's so affordable. And think about it, if you have your sales team using their personal phone numbers, a salesperson leaves and goes to a competitor, you don't have any insight into what phone calls occurred, what people's phone numbers are, that's your company's database. And if you allow the sales team to run amok, or the customer support team, it's just unprofessional, be professional, use open phone. And we use it for things like event communication. So we get one phone number, but it can go to multiple people like a round robin thing, we have a shared phone number. Do that for customer support and open phone is rated number one on g2 for customer satisfaction and you know i trust g2's ratings open phone it's ready it's affordable starts at just 13 bucks a month but twist listeners can get 20 percent off any plan for the first six months at openphone.com twist 
And if you have existing numbers with another service, no problem. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, open phone will port them over at no cost. Head to openphone.com slash twist to start your free trial and get 20% off. So you're playing cards right. and uh, you get bounced out of this tournament and right. uh, you're, you're, you're sitting there uh, doing your post bounce uh, or did you make it to the final table and you're we just were both like bounced gods. out early you Great. nailed it so now you're trying to explain your bad luck <laughs> and how bad everybody else is to each other right we've we've gone over the whinging about our bad beats right mm. that, that took up the first half an hour running through our knockout hands and yeah. then we're sitting there eating chocolate cake and vanilla ice cream and diet cokes because obviously we're yeah, super sure. cool and we you know we're, we're, we're not getting pissed <laughs> we're, to yeah. we're talking about the future of the world and you know both of us have always been interested in like how do we impact the world how you know what does the future look like we've both been very very long-term thinkers and just instinctively that is just one of our kind of gifts i think and i i was particularly interested in you know how you do good in the world and how you know politics shapes our future and stuff like that we were both talking about robotics and you know is now the time for you know robots to come on and automate everything and and i think we both agreed that actually that was way further away than people realized but the thing that was likely to be more prescient is teaching machines to learn their own representations of what is valuable in a space like surely mm. a machine could learn to play poker a machine could learn a set of heuristics and then reproduce those patterns and um, at the time demis was just finishing up his phd and postdoctoral work at, in neuroscience at ucl at the computational neuroscience unit and so he invited me to join the lunch and learns uh which i did for almost six months i think pretty much every day went down to you know basically smuggled in the back door of the gatsby computational neuroscience unit and just listened to the lunch and learns and that's where we met shane leg our third co-founder and then we all went for lunch what is this lunch and learn i mean i can there's lunch and then somebody speaks and you learn uh it's yeah it's like a brown bag lunch you know like where where mm. you know uh, it, it'll be like at the lab so there's 40 or 50 people at the lab and you and people invite different people and so on and mm. so there'll be speakers or there'll be postdocs or every lunch basically someone gives a talk about their work and takes questions and it's it's a bit of a bear pit i mean you know mm. they don't take prisoners if you're if you're not on your toes then you get some pretty rough questions like and it was just an amazing way to learn and be thrown in the deep end and really experience it firsthand I, I i was only 24 at the time mm. um so uh, then uh, basically a few months after that um shane leg got invited to the singularity summit um in uh 2010 to be a speaker because he was on the less wrong forums back in the day uh and is was a you know a bit of a transhumanist to be honest with you at that <laughs> time <laughs> Yeah. uh and then you know we we decided to go because peter was one of the sponsors i think it was the main sponsor of the summit and then we got invited to the drinks afterwards and we used that as an opportunity to pitch pitch peter on on mm. agi you know he was the only person in the valley to his credit talking about agi or even ai in any form to everybody else ai was a weird taboo word and everyone was mm. sort of talking about machine learning but even not really like it was mostly in the labs in the in the academic labs that people talk about machine learning um yeah and then we went to his office in uh in the big park with the presidero yeah the presidium yeah presidio we, presidio yeah. yeah we went there and to the founders fund office and yeah he made a decision on the spot i was pretty easy i think he gave us like two million dollars <laughs> yeah ten so, million dollar valuation not even dude it was like way oh, it was like wow. half that we was really well because we were like randos yeah. from London. I mean, it might he, like he his he he joked that it might as well be Somalia. That was his view. He, he it was literally what he said. Well, you might as well be investing in Somalia. I was like, London's a serious place, <laughs> but apparently not to uh, Peter. Well, uh, you got to also put in context. He had just done the he had done the Facebook investments. Probably feeling pretty good about himself. That was right. going well. And right. uh, you know, five to eight million dollars was what a seed round would evaluation right. would be. <laughs> um, and AI. At the time, to be oh, honest, yeah. as you said, nobody thought there was a commercial application or or that it was going to work, right? Like, that was kind of the big question. Is this actually going to come up with an answer that is going to have some application in the real world? Because you had Deep Blue, right? We had Kasparov got beat. And so narrow AI had proven itself. But IBM had spent hundreds of millions of dollars and they had no product. I mean, that right. was the playing field, right? It was like, this is a money pit. Right. 
and of course that was a decade before us as well you know so mm. that 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 had proven to not have serious commercial applications right. so that was that was actually a kind of non goal in our pitching is to not bring up yeah, don't blue. bring up <laughs> deep blue. don't bring it up because it was like a cool research thing but never quite had it had had the impact that we hoped and yeah you know for the first two or three years it was it was very tough going because you know deep learning just didn't seem to be you know catching on and and then all of a sudden um you know we we had the cat classification paper from uh Alex Ruskevsky AlexNet in 2012 and then in 2013 we had the atari game player um dqn mm. which we published and that was really the thing that changed everything for us because you know larry page had seen uh the demo and she just emailed us cold page at google.com and was like mm. you know you guys should come and come and be part of us i've spent my entire career building the infrastructure to enable a company like you guys to come and work on on agi Stepping back, what was the pitch to Peter? We're going to build reinforcement learning. We don't know if there's an application. It's a science project. Your two million is going to be gone in three years. Like, was there any path to commercialization that you pitched him on? Or was it, let's see what we can do in the lab? There was, yeah. So, I mean, we actually didn't pitch him on reinforcement learning because at that point, that was really early. We mm -hmm. pitched him on deep learning. And... um what we were working on was a visual image search uh, tool for mm. uh, fashion and furniture and, and and clothing and so on. And we actually, I actually, I held the first patent um, for deep learning in this area, which actually takes the shape and the texture and the color of one item of clothing, like ideally a more affordable high street version, and then uses that to find the more expensive. Mm. uh you know equivalent that you could then you know you know go on you know find find a comparison for and um you know that that was a big moment actually because it, it was it was the beginnings of you know the generative ai movement i mean you know it's now called gen ai but it was never called that at the time it was really just deep learning classification yeah at that time forget about generating something you were trying to identify something this is Seriously. a hot dog this is a dog <laughs> these are two different things and, and that had that framework hadn't actually happened yet. What Google was doing at the time was they put two or three low wage people on a group of images, and they would say there is it you know describe five tags for this image, and then whichever three or four came you know in common with two different people, that was what the image was about, right? That was the state of the Google index at the time, right? Spot on. And they yeah. would have them draw bounding boxes around certain parts of the image so this area of the image contains a penguin this one contains an iceberg mm. and you know uh, it, you know turned out that was exactly the kind of thing that this hierarchical neural network representation was pretty good at doing like it would mm. certainly it would essentially cluster together pixels which were correlated around a particular region and then then where there was a sharp distinction like an edge or a line or uh you know a break in a cluster then that would that would end up being a sub representation, and then if then the next layer would absorb that sub representation and increasingly build more and more symbolically mm. representative ideas. Like it would go from you know basically you know a, a tiny little area of the iris to a wider eye to an eyebrow to the side of the face to the full face to the background, and you could kind of think of that as a way of understanding how the hierarchical neural network representation was was formed, and that. And obviously, now that you know we we had made so much progress over the last ten years on the classification side, you then use those classifications to generate novel predictions, and that's mm. that's basically what image generation is doing: is saying, given this sentence, find the sort of optimal representation of all the competing points in this big space that best represents this long sentence mm. as a new image, and that's the transformer model that we hear about in the that 2017 paper from Google. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's, that, that's deep learning, but then there's lots of other generative AI components that were, you know, pushing it that direction, but they did it for, on, they, they made it work first for the language side of things. That was really the big deal. So you get a couple of years into this, you figured a couple of things out uh, and you start getting into reinforcement learning. So, and that's when Larry page was Larry on the board. Or was just Elon on the board at that time and Peter? 
No, so so we had uh, first Peter invest, uh, then Elon, then we were the first check out of. Um, sorry, no, we were the third check out of the first fund of Mark Stad's Dra- Dragoneer. Oh in wow! Two, in two thousand and twelve, I think it was. It was such a great time period to be an investor because only lunatics were starting companies after the great financial crisis. It was like this five year period where if you started a company. You it, you had no choice because you were a lunatic who had to start that company because everything in the world was telling you don't start a company. Right, it's going to be pain and suffering. So you raised this money. What, what was the first project that you guys started to work on? How did you pick it? And then you know what clicked because there were I remember AlphaGo was one, and then there was this clock that became sentient. There were just all these like little projects that we would hear about inside of DeepMind, but DeepMind kind of kept a lot close to the vest i think we i mean we operated in stealth for most yeah. of our entire period and we actually didn't even announce our investors i mean there was a bunch of other like we we had selena chow as another investor from horizon sleek Shing's fund and you know there was a we had a very good group of people we we're lucky i think we raised 45 million dollars in the end so we we every each year we went back i think we raised like we raised two or three and then 10 and then 30 um so. And what did you show each time to keep people investing in the vision during a time when people didn't believe in the vision? Yeah, and most it, people didn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we showed in the second time that we raised, we showed uh, Flatland, which was our little agent-based environment, like a two D grid world, where you know the uh, the model had kind of learned a way to navigate through the environment um, using purely the pixels, and mm. we then said, okay. For our next, you know, milestone, we're going to basically teach the the model to learn um, arbitrary games of Atari. And in the end, we we played fifty six games um, at you know, which is pretty incredible. This is twenty four frames per second, and it's learning to basically correlate actions where it can basically go up, down, left, right, or shoot. Yeah, um, the original Atari twenty six hundred controller. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Which had five actions. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know, so it's basically got to figure out which of those actions it's randomly kind of moving them around at the beginning, and then it stumbles on a rewarding you know moment. It luckily gets some you know gets some score, and then it realizes, okay, that's a useful thing to do. Uh, next time I see the ball bouncing towards me in that position, I'll move the paddle left or right, mm. and it's just kind of incredible that purely through self play and reinforcement learning just very simple heuristic exploration and then exploit the strategy that turns out to be uh useful for generating score and suddenly you can learn to play all the games to basically superhuman performance i mean that was mind-blowing to me and that was all done in an uh, atari 2600 emulator obviously you're not taking a physical joystick and putting a robot on it it's right. able to run very quickly in the cloud right you figured out a way to accelerate it so that it could just be playing whatever pong or tank whatever those early games were adventure play them you know uh, millions of them right how many how many runs did it have to do to be to perfect them did you did you track that like how many how many how many quarters until you perfect the game and you get the high score i mean it's interesting that you mentioned cloud right because this was 2012 13 so there wasn't really any cloud to speak of we actually ran it on prem Mm. uh we had our own little cluster in the office and it used to train Atari DQN. We it used um, two petaflops of computation. So, so a flop is a floating point operation. This is a unit of computation. It's like one calculation. Think of it. And obviously, peta is a well, obviously peta is a million billion. Hmm. So it's two million billion calculations to train the entire model over the course of about two weeks. Hmm. Um, so put that into perspective, like, and then obviously at the time that was, you know, one of the largest, I mean, we don't know for sure, but it, th- there weren't any other big training runs of those kinds of things at that time. So it's fair to say it was probably the largest. Mm. Um, that was a decade ago. And, you know, you roll forward and the models that we train today at Inflection uh, and, you know, the other frontier model companies use 10 billion petaflops. Wow. So, 10 billion million billion floating it, point operations which is insane it's, it's, it's you your human brain cannot even conceive of what that is uh it's kind of like when we start talking about there's a billion suns in our galaxy and right 
that's and there's billions of galaxies the human mind is not designed to even comprehend millions of billions of millions yeah. billions of millions of billions it's, it's just not even possible all right we all know the one thing that separates great startups from the good ones is product velocity what does it mean product velocity fancy term right here you got your product and you got velocity speed the speed in which your product improves so can you ship updates can you release new features can you do bug fixes can you iterate on the interface can you solve problems for your customers and can you do it quickly because you're not alone you have competitors and your customers have choices they may fit solve their problems by writing their own custom code or they might use your solution this is what startups are about how fast can you get that product velocity going and so you know how are you how do you supercharge it Everybody says, okay, yeah, we want to go faster, but you got to go faster intelligently. And Crowdbotics is going to help you do that. They're your CTO as a service. Basically, they provide you with the most optimal architecture to get your product to market as fast as possible. You'll have access to an on-demand product manager and developer talent, and they will help get your app into production 10 times faster than conventional development. Crowdbotics can work with your in-house dev team, or you can just have them work independently. And you own all the IP, you own all the source code, let the folks at Crowdbotics supercharge your product velocity today, no more waiting, get a free build plan at crowdbotics.com slash twist. That's a $4.99 value just for the twist listeners, you get that for free. That's C-R-O-W-D-B-O-T-I-C-S dot com slash twist for a free build plan. The hardware did start to catch up here and in, in in hardware seems to have been part of the enabling here. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what the infrastructure looked like at that time, the hardware yeah. footprint versus what we see today and what you're doing at inflection I and mean, the hardware it, footprint. It's a great point. I mean, it's, it's really the hardware revolution rather than the AI revolution. I mean, the, yeah, it's, it's funny Say because more. People, yeah. people fixate on the algorithms. Um, obviously the algorithms are critical, but they, they really have, not evolved at the exponential rate mm. that computing has evolved at right so those 10 billion million billion petaflops i described that's a that that is the equivalent of one order of magnitude so 10x increase in the total amount of compute used for the cutting edge models every year for 10 years mm. the 10 to the power of 10 i mean it's insane um it's truly insane so so yeah, that is basically about hardware. And yeah. I, that's why I think actually this revolution is, has been easier to predict than I think people, people realize. I mean, it, it, this yeah. trajectory has been continuing for a long time and we can look out at what the next three, four, five doublings look like. Um, or sorry, three or four, five, 10 X's look like. They're not doublings anymore like Moore's Law. They're, they're orders of magnitude increase in compute. And that's a very predictable trajectory. I mean, obviously, it's unclear exactly what the what what capabilities emerge from that. But you know, you can certainly predict what we're going to be able to build. Steve Jervison has a lot of charts on this where he's been tracking. I don't know if you've seen Steve's charts on just you know um, the amount of computing power, and, and you know the the sort of tipping point is somewhat predictable. And now we've got heat and power friction. I guess is the the limit right now or how much we can connect these supercomputers together what, what what's the gating factor now it's a good point. Or, uh, yeah it's a good point that, that that is going to become the constraint so the the a100 uses um, 700 watt uh per chip the h100 is twice that like 1200 watt um wow so the next ch per chip right so obviously you have eight of these on a node then the chassis and the node itself has some additional power constraints, you know, so they're actually, it's a different data center design to, you know, what it was two or three years ago where, you know, there's actually spaces in between racks. They're not like completely yeah. stacked up. They have to be like really large gaps in between. And I, and some of the designs I've seen for, for new cooling systems are that there will actually be fans in between the node layers. Yeah. Um, so and all fiber optics, all glass, photonic oh, yeah. computing to to transfer data from one to the other because the amount of data being moved now can't be moved over copper, can't be moved over Ethernet cables. It's just too much, right? Being moved oh, around. For sure, for sure. Yeah. All of it is is a fiber optic cable. It's actually called InfiniBand, the yeah. um Mellanox um NVIDIA cabling. 
and that that's like 900 gigabyte a second um which, which is pretty nuts for you know direct chip to chip connections um you know so it, it it is really driven by all the hardware innovations and those hardware innovations are very predictable because you know they're they're actually laid out three years in advance uh yeah because they're planning on building they're building those schematics and getting the fabs and the factories ready to actually build them right um so there's starts to be a little controversy inside of deep i guess at a certain point um uh, larry page is like we need this team inside of google maybe peter tl elon wants you to stay independent maybe you could explain that moment in time and and the decision making there yeah, I mean, I think this was way back in 2014 that we were acquired. Um, and, you know, I think that Elon and Peter, all of our investors, you know, wanted us to stay independent. And I think that um, the challenging decision for us was just the scale of investment that we could see that would be required mm -hmm. um, going forward. I mean, we'd raised $40 million and you know, we could see a path to spending $500 million in three to five years. And in fact, that's what we ended up doing exactly that. Um, you know, DeepMind now has I think, 12, 1300 people and spends over a billion dollars on compute a year. So wow. I mean, that's, that's public information. So, you know, the, the, it's, it's pretty remarkable, the trajectory. And, yeah. um, so one of the things that we were focused on, you know, Larry made us an incredible offer to be able to do that. We were acquired for $650 million um, pre-revenue, obviously. Yeah, it's um, a pretty great deal. A pretty uh, especially good at deal. the time. I mean, the world has changed dramatically in the last decade. But at the time, this was people were shaking their heads like, what do they buy? I mean, yeah. in fact, the conversation was, I think you had maybe 100 people at the time. Uh, less. And yeah, 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 exactly. The conversation was is Larry lost his mind, he just paid $10 million per engineer. And then that became, well, engineers in Silicon Valley are worth 10 million each. I was like, well, these are different types of engineers, you hired a very elite group of people, maybe you could talk about the recruiting of bringing together the DeepMind team at the time, because it was a lot of PhDs, a lot of people who had some, you had a pretty deep bench there. Yeah, we were extremely focused on hiring the best PhDs and postdocs, actually, and mm -hmm. I've carried that through to how I hire an inflection. I mean, you know, you it, talent is the differentiator at the end of the day. I mean, you could be first to get access to compute, you can have the most amount of capital, but selecting a very, very high quality team is really the only thing that makes the real difference. And that means you have to be very deliberate about who you don't hire. Um, you know, it, it was actually amazing at that time how many people who were fundamental to the deep learning revolution we had around us, right? So, you know, um, Jeff Hinton, was uh, one of our consultants uh, for two years before he set up his company that he then sold to Google. So it was Ilya Satskiva, the chief scientist of um, OpenAI now. Um, Wojciech was an intern at DeepMind who was one of the co-founders of uh, OpenAI. It's going to be like the PayPal mafia. It's going to be the DeepMind. It's already turned out to be the DeepMind mafia, basically. you got a whole group of alumni who are just creating the future here. Yeah. Was it a looking back on it? Was it a mistake to sell? You regret selling to Google? Should you have taken Elon's advice and stayed independent? Or I mean, think about it? Elon was certainly keen for us to come and be do the Tesla thing, be part of his <laughs> ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I'll be honest. I was a bit. I mean, back then, you know, he's an incredible person. But sure. I mean, it, it was a very uncertain uh bet in Tesla 2014. 2014 would be the definition <laughs> of uncertain i mean model three almost killed him almost killed the company i mean that company's had a near-death experience with each launch of a product right. um i mean uh, you want to talk about hard hardware plus software uh, and manufacturing at scale and building a public brand i mean the degree right. of difficulty is absurd inside of google to the extent you can talk about it uh you guys worked on a, a lot of theoretical things but you also worked on a lot of practical stuff what were the big wins inside of google that you can talk about that deepmind participated in yeah i mean we uh deployed deepmind technologies on all of the main products other than search actually and youtube um mm. so i think we did seven pas in the end on everything from um data centers to healthcare to play store to android battery optimization to android operating system 
I mean, we, we reduced the amount of energy needed to call the Google data center fleet by 30%. Hmm. Um, wow. and that was a three year collaboration. So huge project. We made the Google wind turbines 20% more efficient, which Google has the l largest wind turn, the t largest wind turbine farm in the world. It's pretty wow. crazy. Um, that. yeah, we designed the activity classification, uh, algorithms for, uh, all the wearable devices that would basically tell whether you're they sleeping wouldn't or let running you touch or walking. The two biggest franchises. They wouldn't let you touch search. They wouldn't no. let you touch YouTube. Why would they, you got this incredible thousand folks and you don't yeah. let them touch the two biggest franchises. Why? Well, we, Politics? the truth is, no, I mean, we tried and we actually tried YouTube in 2015 and we mm. failed. It was too early and it was, it was just super hard. We were trying to optimize watch next time, actually. Yeah. Um, and we were trying to use reinforcement learning for it and it was just too, it was too early. We, we, we didn't succeed. Mm. Um, search is a different story. I mean, search is just so difficult to ship it's anything so in. They're yeah. super conservative. They also, they like the fact that all of the rules are very transparent so they can mm. see exactly why a page is being recommended and really have much more transparency on the algorithm, which is very understandable. So uh, in fact, there were some, you know, deployments of deep learning systems, which ended up causing regressions over time because of drift, um, mm. you know, over, over a six month period. And in so, other words, quality would go down. Well, it would go up initially at the beginning and then come get, down. And yeah. then come down exactly. Why? Why does that? Why does that drift happen? People are talking about that with ChatGPT four that results have deprecated. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand why that would occur. Is it garbage in, garbage out kind of situation? What's what's happening? Well, when something like that happens, I think there's slightly different problems. I think with the ChatGPT thing, it's probably that they basically serve their best model, which mm. is expensive to serve, right? Because it's the biggest and best and uses the most number of GPUs. And then once people are coming back frequently, they'll use they'll serve a smaller model, <laughs> which ah, is cheaper. There'd be a less well trained model. Quality is basically, as as always the case, quality is cost, right? So mm. we can serve a cheaper model for uh, you know quicker, um, but it won't be as good. So that mm. that's probably what's going on. I think. Um, ah, yeah. I've never heard that theory, but that would track and make sense. Um, and as more people use it. They they may have no choice but to give everybody a, a little bit of an easier model to use or a more basic model because they don't they don't have a choice. Well, and the other variable would be speed. So mm. if you want it really fast, then you have to get a smaller model, mm. or you have to use more chips to serve a super large model. Yeah. So you you can't have all three. And so if you want a super high quality one, you could have it a re really slow and cheap, but that would mm. be really slow, like twenty seconds or something for a response. Listen, if you're in the tech industry, you know about Carta. Carta is the leading venture capital and equity management platform, and they have huge news to share here on This Week in Startups. Carta now lets you syndicate an SPV. You know what an SPV is, a special purpose vehicle. So you create an SPV on Carta. Why would you do that? Hey, listen, you're an angel investor, and you're putting 25K in a company like I did with com.com, but you got about 20 friends who also want to put in 5 or 10K. Now you put them all into an SPV, you tell the team over at com.com or whatever company you're investing in, it's going to be one line item. I'll sign for all 25 of those angels. And they say, oh, great. Can I put 10 other angels in your SPV? And then, you, hey, if you want to take carry on it because you syndicated the deal, great. Now you got a business model going, huh? They are used by more than 4,500 funds representing over $120 billion in assets under administration. They're going to support you at every stage of your fundraising journey. From doing your first syndicate to building a global venture capital firm, you can raise and deploy from anywhere in the world because Carta offers US and international SPVs. Also, Carta provides an automated back off solution for you so you can focus on what matters, finding great startups, building relationships and supporting the heck out of those founders. Here's your call to action. Go to Carta.com slash twist and use the code twist to get 10% off your first SPV. What a deal. Carta, C A R T A dot com slash T W I S T. Make sure you use the promo code TWIST for 10% off. Just wrapping up your time at Google, they never launched any of this stuff until OpenAI did, uh, but they right. clearly had it sitting there. Right. Um, it makes sense that Google has more responsibility 
with their brand name and they they can't put stuff out there that's schlocky or confusing under the google brand name but eventually i guess open ai and microsoft forced their hands right why did it go down that way yeah i mean people say google was asleep at the wheel and all the rest of it but it, you know it's not quite true i think um so i i was there at google and working on the lambda team right so mm. that i spent a year and a half working on that team and we um you know basically had chat gpt before chat gpt it was yeah. incredible i mean su summer of 2020 I and mean, we we had it it was working it was amazing and we were actually and was that what we saw in the go in gmail autocomplete was that model it or? wasn't gmail autocomplete but it was featured by sundar in may at io the right. annual developer conference at, at um yeah in 2020 so and he actually it was actually featured as lambda mm. you can see it up there now and yeah he, he actually had a conversation we designed it was so stupid we he had a conversation with a paper airplane about what 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 it's like to be a paper airplane and then he had mm. a conversation with pluto and then the language model pretended it was pluto and like you know yeah. talked about the weather and stuff well you know what we always say examples matter and they pick terrible examples <laughs> <laughs> exactly literally you know when you're when you're pitching your startup you're pitching a new product you want the most evocative interesting applicable example well, and they picked it's, two inane ones and, and and I can tell you it was deliberate because we didn't want it to look like a person or sound like a person. We uh. wanted it to be kind of like, a, you know, sharing the cool technology, but it was just, you know, the first mm. small step in that direction. Don't be scared. It's not taking your job. <laughs> it's Basically. just Pluto. <laughs> right. I mean, if you make it a doctor or you make it a librarian or you make it a copy editor or, you know, all of a sudden it's like, hmm. And, and that's what's happened today which I think is a good pivot point here. So anyway, suffice it to say, Google is a large organization, they're conservative. And so they just took a measured approach. And they have the goods. Right. Am I think I there was just a, a confidence a, that, you uh, know, we don't have to go first on this. And mm. that we could take more time to get it right. And that, you know, search is just this phenomenal lock in in distribution and data. Mm. And I, I think that's going to pay dividends because I, I per, you know, I think Google's going to be just fine. I mean, Google, Google's going to be fine. I agree. I bought Google shares when I saw this going down because I was like, I, I looked at Bard. Me too. And I'm watching yeah. Bard and I'm like, you've got so much clickstream data and you got so much local data that it's all of a sudden doing links, tables, it's putting in photos. I mean, I've seen this movie before. I watch Google go from 10 blue links to, you know, comprehensive search content shopping maps everything and that happened yeah. over a decade or two and it's obviously going to happen in there and I, I also think the ad model you know th there is a theory like the more confusing it is the more you click on ads but if you do a search for travel there's no reason that links inside the barred result cannot be monetizable in fact they will right i think that's true what do you think? i think i yeah. think where google is going to struggle is that google has developed an incredible expertise for getting in its own way right it's just almost mm. like the master of like internal chaos and so there's loads of you know amazing teams and projects which just block each other because there's huge amounts of duplication it's a very chaotic mm. place it really is and so i think that's that's going to be challenging for them and i think the second thing is the ad model may not be the model of the future right it mm. may be the case that people cannot tolerate having a uh, you know an ai in your pocket that is funded by whoever is the highest bidder trying to mm. sell you something because these models are so persuasive because they're so personal because they'll get to know you because you end up having you know um, conversations with them and sharing information that you wouldn't normally type in a regular search query where it's just like you might say like you know something sensitive about your cancer or your you know whatever your heartbreak you know but it's not the same as having a fluent continuous natural language conversation as though you and just like you and i are now right and so i think people are not going to want you know your ai to suddenly turn around and say by the way ta-da like i'm yeah. i'm you know so we'll see how that turns out and i, I think google's going to struggle with that one yeah, it could be affiliate links. You know, if I, if I was talk, I was talking to my AI and I'm suffer, I'm melancholy. I got depression. I'm feeling sad, and it knows my my AI knows I'm sad. Uh, it could be like you know maybe exercise, cold plunge bath, go see a psychiatrist. It, 
all of those things are monetizable links in some way. Um, and so, you know, if it gives you the perfect answer, the question is, is, is it possible to monetize if you just right. got the answer? And Larry always said, like, eventually, we're going to give you the answer. We're just right. going to give you the answer. And so it, 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 the mind does wonder if that screws up the ad auction in a major way. Well, and, and that's precisely the problem number three for Google, which is that if Google always gives you the answer, then what is the you know, future for the open web? Because Google is going to disintermediate the third, car the third party content creator. Like if you're mm. a regular mom and pop shop with your bakery on a website or you have a blog post and you rely on that display ad income, well, Google's just going to give you the perfect recipe. So why would you ever go to that kind of third party blog post? And that's yeah. actually a problem for Google and the regulator because Google has been telling the regulator for the best part of 15 years that the reason it can crawl all of these websites is because it's only indexing so that it can redirect the user yes. to the third party page. Not it feels so fair. It feels fair. Right. right. It's a yellow yeah. pages, they always used to say. It's yeah. a lookup table. Whereas if it's now cutting out the, that source of information and giving you the perfect answer, that's a big problem with the regulator, certainly in the European context, because many Google execs have been on the witness stand claiming that they will never do that, right? So it's and also now the models are doing that. They've been trained on the web. It's obvious. It's been proven. You can, and you used to be able to ask OpenAI, ChatGPT, like, hey, wh where is this answer trained from? It would actually tell you um, some of the training data. I think it doesn't do that now. What's the fair outcome here for pools of data, lakes, oceans of data, and who gets to leverage them to build these models? What, what do you think is the outcome here? Because we're starting to see the lawsuits pile up. We're starting to see, you know, Elon say, hey, Twitter data is not available. Reddit saying it's available at a price. Quora saying it's available at a price or maybe with a link back. Stack Overflow built their own language model. This new CEO just emailed me to say, like, look, <laughs> I know keeps Stack Overflow keeps coming up. We're building our own copilot. Nobody else can use our data set. So talk to me a little bit about what you think will happen in the industry because i feel like it's tremendously unfair to take gourmet or whatever recipe database and then just give the answer and not give a citation at least what's going to happen here's the tricky thing i mean the reality is that the information was placed on the open web and the open source crawling engines have gathered up their information um under perfectly legal uh you know acceptable terms and that crawler you know the common crawl crawler you know collects the information and clearly says that it would be used for um you know research and development pur purposes and you know be used for experimentation by, by other you know people trying to build other products off the on, on top of the open source search engine so the crawler the crawling data that everyone's collected is is just a well-established status quo so i don't mm. think that is going to be undone or there's going to be any compensation, you know, people sometimes mm. talk about this data trusts idea where, you know, each individual data contributor gets like one cent or something. I mean, this is not going to happen, I think. Why um, not? Too hard just, to execute on? I think it's impossible to generate sufficient revenues to make the payment to the end, you know, producer mm. of data material, right? Mm. So maybe in the case of a very large data owner, like... You know, OpenAI just did a deal with Associated Press, right? But that's right, actually so not for historic data. That's actually for fresh, uh, real-time news. news. See, that's where I think there is a possibility of this, if we think as an industry collectively, that this could actually be a benefit. You remember Minitel in France used to charge a certain amount per hour, and they would share that with the data sources. Uh, AOL used to charge three, four, five bucks an hour CompuServe, and they would share that with the data provider. So if you were on some data site that had to do with weddings or whatever, they would just give them 50 cents of the hour, right? You actually had a model there. I think if we took robots.txt and we put in a license and said, hey, listen, these are my recipes. I'm Gordon Ramsay. If you want them in your index, mazel tov. There's a thousand recipes. It's a minimum payment each year of $10 a recipe. It's $10,000 a year to put it into your index. Plus, I want something on top of it, whatever it is. And that might be enough to incentivize people to start putting more recipes online. Mm, mm. 
It's possible. It's possible. I mean, I, th I think the, the challenge with these things is that the creative tools are now going to be so widely available that the models are going to be, you know, better mm. at generating new recipes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a way, it's true. Yeah. It's so tell totally me, true. You, uh, you leave Google uh, and you start inflection with uh, Reid Hoffman, who's just on the pod. Um, you raised a bunch of money. What is inflection AI? What 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 is the goal here? Well, you obviously uh, got to um, see everything up close and personal that's happened uh, with OpenAI and with DeepMind. Uh, where do you sit uh, in that sort of pantheon of you know elite uh, AI offerings? You got Bard over here. You got OpenAI over here. Where where, where are you going to sit? And and what market are you going to try to carve out? So we're developing a personal AI. Um, I believe there are going to be lots of different types of AIs. There'll be business AIs, you know, there'll be medical, legal, you know, every digital influencer will be an AI, every brand and big platform that's trying to sell stuff will have their own AI that, you know, that is more the marketing AI. I think, you know, wherever you see a website or an app, expect that in the next five years, that's going to become a conversational interface that you might as well just call an AI. Right. Mm. It's, it'll be able to produce video and text and audio and talk to you just as I'm talking to you now. Mm. In that world where everything becomes an AI, I think you as an individual consumer want to have a personal AI that is on your team, right? It is fiduciary aligned to your interests in your corner, helping you find information, identify credible sources, negotiate with other AIs for the best bargains, plan and prioritize your day and, you know, your thoughts, your ideas, follow up on your research interests, find you entertaining information. And it is super important that it's personalized to you because you're going to end up sharing a lot of sensitive, personal, intimate information in order that it can then go out and be your representative, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's in gaming environment and it's kind of in the metaverse or whether it is you know, looking for sports news, you know, for, on your behalf and coming back to you and talking about it. Like the way I think about it is, is kind of like, imagine if everybody had a chief of staff, right? Mm. A digital chief of staff that was a coordinator, scheduler, prioritizer, summarizer, you know, yeah. you wake up in the morning and it gives you the perfect briefing of everything you've got on in your day. What's happened with the news, what's happened with the sports, mm. the companies that you're tracking. Um, that is it what I think reminds of a personal me of, AI. Uh, remember General Magic? Uh, yep. And there, yeah. This is, we're, we're dating ourselves, but Sony and a company called General Magic made a PDA, personal digital assistant device, uh, long before Palm. I think there was a documentary on it, um, but they had a concept of agents. And the this is before search, really, on the internet. Uh, search engines even existed. And the agent would go on your behalf and go find you flights or go find you reservations, or go do tasks for you. And so you see this AI as being autonomous in some ways and being able to put it on repeat tasks. Hey, I'm trying to lose weight. I want to be 165 pounds. What should I be doing? And then it's going to counsel me every day about that. Right. And if, if you're going to put an AI in that kind of position, which it will be incredibly effective at doing, because it's not going to nag you and moan, it's going to you know, be inspiring, it's going to be reassuring, it's going to be gentle and polite and respectful. I mean, it's it's not going to be an asshole about it, unless that's obviously yeah. what you want. <laughs> you, you, whatever, you're whatever you're into. Whatever you're into. Please fat shame me. <laughs> I am not worthy. <laughs> yeah. it, could, it could get weird. It could but, get weird. But, but to your point, you it's going to be personalized and it's going to be your agent. And so this framework is critically important in terms of your vision is that it's your agent, it's working on your behalf, not the corporation's behalf, not open AIs, not Bing search results or Google search results. This is your AI. And whatever you talk to it about, we don't have any insights into and if you put data into it, we're not sharing that with advertisers or anybody else. So that means I have to pay you 100 bucks a year for this. Yeah, I mean, that, at the end of the day, if you want to have full trust, you need to not be the product. And if you're yeah. not paying for it, somebody else is paying for it. And if you're putting that amount of attention and sensitive information into a place, the only way to make sure that it's on your team is for you to pay for it in some way. Like you wouldn't rock up and be like, mm. oh, my accountant is actually being 
funded by, you know, this insurance company. Yeah. And so I'm going to go and speak to my accountant and you're trying to get, you know, your, your, your tax return done, or, you know, mm. you're trying to decide on how to make some investment. And you're like, well, is, are you working for me or are you trying to sell some insurance product or whatever? Right. Yeah. I think understanding the intent and the business model is so critical and consumers are super savvy now. Like they understand it. You, you, you can't get over on customers now. They, they expect that like Alexa is listening to them even you know, in serving them up ads, even when that's not what's actually happening. But, you know, they they are pretty empowered and, and they understand this concept of you are the, um, if, if you're not paying, you're the product. So I, I've used it a bit. Quite delightful, beautifully designed. Um, what can we expect to be the beachhead markets or tasks that you think it's going to delight people with in the early days here? Well, so far, you know, we've we've actually only got a small model that shipped in production, right? So, yeah. you know, only founded the company a short while ago, sort of fifteen months ago now, and we're just bringing up our super uh, cluster. Um, so, you know, just a few months ago, we raised a pretty large round, and you know, we've we're building out the largest cluster of H one hundreds that's in operation in the world today. So today, we have the largest cluster of uh, oh, wow. the largest operational cluster of H one hundreds. By the end of the year, we will have. 22,000 H100s, which is equivalent of about 80,000 A100s wow. um, in a single cluster. Um, and NVIDIA, uh, you had to go wait on their doorstep and beg them to <laughs> buy these. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about the scarcity of these H100s. Uh, yeah, they're extremely scarce. I mean, NVIDIA is one of our investors. Um, so that works. Yeah. So is Microsoft. Um uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that we, we were just very lucky to get to the top of the supply chain with them and they've, yeah. they've been great to us. So it's, it's been incredible. We, we've also helped them optimize their cluster for mm. ML perf. So they have an open source benchmark that stress test is stress tests their cluster. So we've invested a huge amount over the last six months to optimize their cluster. Mm. Um, so it was kind of a good quid pro quo that we were both the guinea pigs, um, and also the beneficiaries of the first big shipment. When this $1.3 billion, uh, raise was announced, it was a little confusing to people because Microsoft, you know, has this big bet on, uh, open AI and then, you know, they're making this big bet here. What, what, what should we take away from Microsoft's behavior here, investing in you and open AI? It was kind of confusing for folks. I think the way to think about it is that Microsoft is a platform of platforms. You know, it's traditionally been very good at doing deals with lots and lots of third parties interacting with a whole range of different suppliers. And I mm -hmm. think, um, you know, that's probably how they're going to continue. They, they want to back lots of the best teams. And, um, you know, we, we have one of the strongest teams in the world right now, if not the second best team in the world. And we have the co-creators of GPT-2, GPT-3, Llama, Chinchilla. Gopher, mm. Palm, Lambda. How much of the 1.3 billion goes to hardware? Just a better curiosity. Almost entirely. <laughs> really? So I just like ship it right it. to NVIDIA and build out this gigantic data center to do that. And then that becomes a massive competitive advantage. Yeah. It's a, it will be a huge advantage because we will train models that are very, very much larger than GPT-4 uh, before anybody else in the world. So... Mm um you know by by the spring for sure maybe even a little bit earlier so um you know all of it goes to compute basically we're, we're you, only 40 people did, oh wow and so did you consider using google cloud or amazon web services or azure or do you need to control the hardware in order to get the gains that you need to see no, we, we, we wouldn't use tpus um they're they're, <laughs> they're difficult for other reasons um, but we, you know, so we certainly wanted NVIDIA. So we did look at AWS and Oracle and stuff. And, you know, um, we actually do use Azure for some workloads, but we, we wanted to make sure we designed the, the, the architecture for the H 100s and we've, we've really optimized everything, you know, down to the lowest levels in terms of how that operates and try and get maximum performance out of it. How long does it take to build out this cluster? It's going to take a year or two. It takes a while. So, I mean, we, we're, we're currently uh operational with 7000 uh h100s um uh will be 22000 fully operational by the beginning of December so it's pretty wow. quick yeah that's unbelievable and this is just in 
just different data centers around the world you co-locate in and you just start racking them? No, it's just one data center because we need it all to be in the same place. So ah. it's actually the size of like three football pitches. Where is uh, it? Where's the data center? I'm curious. Uh, we, it's in the US. <laughs> oh, it's in the US. I don't want to say. Yeah, okay. We can't yeah, say, yeah. Got to be near um, something that's got hydroelectric or some nuclear power plant. Exactly. <laughs> Nailed it. That's exactly what it is. Or solar. <laughs> or solar. Yeah, got to be near something. Uh, so tell me when we look at um, the downside to AI, obviously, this has been a big debate. And, you know, there's job compression does seem to me I asked a lot of smart people on the program from Brian Chesky at Airbnb to Aaron Levy at Box. I asked everybody like, what kind of gains are you seeing internally on your team? Almost universally, people say 30%. Everybody's 30% more effective, whether it's a developer, copywriter, customer support, whatever. Uh, Which means every two years, people become twice as good at their job or efficient rule 72 ish. There's job compression, and then there's like scary scenarios. People are going to use this to hack things or, you know, build super biological weapons. How concerned are you about each of those or those two specific scenarios? And how do you think society should think about them? Terrorism, crazy people, and then just job loss or maybe displacement. It's a it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm very concerned about it. I've um, it's something that I've worked on my entire career. Um, the ethics and safety of of AI. Um, in fact, our business plan back in 2010, which I wrote, was had the strap line building safe and ethical AGI. Mm. So I think we saw a lot of these risks right from the outset, and I'm still. I think it's appropriate to be pretty concerned around them. Um, I don't agree with a lot of the timelines i think people are very anxious that we're about to have this intelligence explosion and it's somehow going to present an existential risk to our world but i've actually just written a book uh called the coming wave um and it basically looks at um all of the threats basically uh Mm. that ai might create over the next 10 to 15 years uh as well as the synthetic biology threats and i think the labor market risk is a real one I think mm. for the next 10 years, people will get more productive. Mm-hmm. Um, but the challenge is that the increases in that productivity are going to generate surplus value, which will be captured by capital and mm. not labor, which means that we probably won't see you know, an average increase in wages, uh, mm. certainly for the middle. Um, those who are doing, you can think of it as like cognitive manual labor, back yes. office administration, basic telephone calls they're new factory workers right like they become the and so the steam engine the factory the robots can replace them we were very dismissive i think about factory workers losing their jobs but now that it's white collar yeah it's uh i think people are like wait a second you could make a logo better than the designer i mean we're kind of there right now that you could create a logo or a tagline as good or better than a marketing agency and i think when people see that it doesn't take a genius to say not going to need as many marketing agencies or not going to need as many logo creators or and the logos question is cost how, less. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. I mean, everything is going to cost less, which is amazing. That is going to drive hmm. the biggest productivity explosion we have seen in the history of our species, right? Hmm. It is truly going to be an incredible couple of decades. But the reality is that those who have their jobs displaced are not going to be able to retrain adapt their role and then compete against man plus machine in the labor market in good enough time like if you're a designer there's only x number of design slots in the world right Mm -hmm. jobs right and if suddenly the work of that x number is being done by 70 percent of the humans because they're aided and augmented and accelerated by you know, good AI, then there's going to be people who are basically graphic designers who are squeezed out and Mm -hmm. they'll have to then do the next tier down of work and that will squeeze out the next tier below that. So you're going to get this tiering um, where the bottom is squeezed out more and more. And I don't see how those bottom are going to be able to adapt quickly enough. And that's why there's a tough remedy, which a lot of people don't like, but you've got to face the facts, which is if you don't want there to be really significant structural disemployment where people cannot compete in the labor market, but they want to, 
then there has to be some kind of subsidization for retraining. UBI, retraining, something. Yeah. And before you get to full UBI, there's there's obviously you don't have to go as far as that to begin with, but that yeah. is the direction of travel over a 20-year period. Well, one of the great things is we create new jobs when old jobs get retired, and it really is the pace at which that happens. Uh, it's kind of sad that cashiers have lost their jobs over the last 10 years. But I remember when they went on strike and McDonald's cashiers were like, we need to make 20 bucks an hour to make this job work. And then McDonald's was like, that's interesting because we have a company that wants to build registers that are touchscreens and they're getting cheaper. And the cost curve at some point, Panera Bread and McDonald's were like, why do we need cashiers? Put one and then everything else is going to be ordering on a kiosk. And that job has been eliminated. Those people can go find other jobs. Podcasting's a job now. It's the speed and how we manage the transition because we will create new work. There will be new demand. People will have new you know, income because of this productivity boost. And so people will have money to spend and people will be more efficient so they could uh, deliver the same output with less work. So the question is, how you manage the transition for this period of you know the next couple of decades where people who get pushed out of the workforce have to somehow retrain and adapt i mean even you know it, it's it's pretty clear that there's a retraining and adaptation requirement and that many people are just not going to be able to keep up we start with factories we start with coal workers you know if you're a coal worker and that's all you've done for 20 years the idea that at 45 years old you're going to just magically learn to code or become a blogger Kind of hard to think. But then again, with AI tutoring, maybe there's an opportunity that the, the AI tutoring will get so good that people can actually learn skills faster with customized education. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, people, this is the incredible thing is that it will be a very meritocratic moment because mm. a lot of people who have had safe and steady families for two, three, four generations yeah. have inherited peace and stability in their life. And that has turbocharged their education. It's given them confidence. It's given them emotional support. It's mm. given them, you know, access to education, access to opportunities. What's going to happen now is that those people who've been on a comfortable trajectory are going to face the competition by people who are hungrier and who mm. now have access to personalized AI tutors yeah. that are going to teach you anything that you're obsessed by, anything that you want to go deep on. It's infinitely patient. It's infinitely smart. It knows exactly how you like to learn. And it's free. And it's going to basically be free. or, free or, or close it, to free. Yeah. Close to free. I mean, compared to a college education, it's going to be free for sure. <laughs> I mean, compared, and it's just basically getting an internet connection. And, you know, then you are going towards the third rail, which is motivation and right. drive. And this is a very hard conversation for people to have. But it might be the case that there's somebody in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, San Paulo, who wants it more than somebody in San Diego or Brooklyn, and they're just going to work harder and they're going to spend more time on that AI. And now it's a global that AI tutor, and it's a global marketplace. And right. and that's I think going to be very scary for people. Is oh my god, I'm competing against you know the top five percent on a global basis who now have Starlink, have a internet high speed connection, and they've got the AI tutor in the cloud, the Khan Academy teacher that is infinitely patient and yeah that's your privilege in the west that you were born in london or new york means nothing in that scenario right yeah i mean i, I have a whole section about that in the book which i really enjoyed writing i mean it's is it's about exactly that story because the costs of production are going through the floor and everything is now going to be zero marginal cost so knowledge is widely available right mm. and now not just knowledge but intelligence right mm. intelligence being the mode of synthesizing knowledge and turning it into new strategies or insights or action plans mm. that if that goes to zero marginal cost then why shouldn't anybody be able to be super creative and it really is going to be about how hungry and dynamic you are as an individual which i think is going to really displace or you know it's going to undermine or put some pressure on the you know the complacency class that has kind of like taken over us a little bit in 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 the west it's the group of elites who get into their college because they're a legacy. And if you're a legacy person and you get into Harvard, guess what? It may not mean as much as the person who's motivated and becomes a 
a neurosurgeon or a developer and they're from like i said you know bangalore and they just wanted it more than you and now they're going to be society is going to be super useful for them uh listen this has been great thank you for giving me over an hour of your time gotta have you come back everybody should try um uh it's pi right is the the name of the personal assistant pai is the uh short uh, pi oh, pi 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 dot ai so pi stands for personal intelligence yeah pi right. dot ai and the book's called the coming wave which is available now i, so I didn't realize you had the book i'm going to read it this week and i'm going to order the audio book now uh when did the book come out uh it's actually available for pre-order now comes out september the 5th oh fantastic so perfect well after i read it, i'll have to have you come back on and we'll talk all about it and uh hopefully we have a book party or something for you here in the valley uh yeah. if you need if you need a if you need the world's greatest moderator uh to interview you at any book parties or something let me know i'm available <laughs> well and also <laughs> if I, apparently if i fancy getting married anytime soon you're available for that too right so apparently you know. the world's greatest uh <laughs> officiant is available if you can find a woman who will marry you mustafa uh but Don't you got a start that. up <laughs> you, oh you already got that accomplished <laughs> no no i'm struggling with that i'm very much sing single so i mean if you want to marry me to my you're startup not collection you 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 are married, <laughs> married to your startup you raise literally. a billion dollars i can tell you who you're married to for the next 10 years <laughs> absolutely <laughs> inflection ai and your 40 people over there also yeah. you're hiring so if you want to join uh inflection go to inflection ai and um listen it's an elite group uh they're in the bay area palo alto london you believe in people working out of an office or you think uh, remote work is fine? What's your what's your take on all this? I, I have an interesting, we have an interesting balance, actually. So I think that you need the best of both worlds. So the way that we operate is that we run the entire company on a six week cycle, right? So hmm. when you when you join the company, you sign up to traveling to be in person for a full week, wherever you are in the world for our seventh week meetups. And ah. that's a key part of the schedule because then for that for that one week in our seventh week meetup, we have a very intense hackathon style meetup where it's, you know, the classic 14, 16 hours a day in the same room, really going at it hardcore. It. And the rest of the six weeks, we recognize that people need to work in a flexible way. So I mm -hmm. am personally in every day. And so is probably about a third of the company. Uh, I would say another third come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some people are actually fully remote. So that's the right hybrid structure, I think. I agree with you. You know, if you have, my belief is a third of people are more productive rem as remote workers. And over the last two years, I figured out who they are. And then there's another two thirds that do better work when they're in an office with other people, just like some people are better runners alone. And then other people, when they run with a group, the majority of people, when you run with a group, you will perform uh better when you're running with runners who are faster than you it's that simple or you play with poker players you're better than you're gonna get better quicker and so i think there might be on the margins 25 percent a third who are better remote but i think two-thirds are better in person and uh, that's I'm for sure true in person. and there's no way that those people can stay completely remote forever I, I i personally am not a believer in these fully remote environments so that's why we do this six one rhythm i, love I think it's the right amount basically it's the right amount of sacrifice it creates a certain um esprit de corpse you know like it, i could see it being super motivating to like get together and then yeah some people got kids they got family you're hiring people who are uber successful and have many options so it's not like right. you can always dictate you know you might have somebody who's just a genius who wants to live at lake tahoe and you, you may be able to break her off for a week to come but you might not get her for the seven weeks so you don't want to lose that person right i think that's the weird standoff we now have or maybe it's a settlement um right. amongst workers and, and corporations right because you don't want to lose a high performer right right exactly so i mean getting the flexibility is the right way to do it and having the kind of peace during the cycle that some people need not everyone mm -hmm. but some people need to do their own thing and then have the super intense meetup which i think is I a good that. rhythm that's so yeah i mean it's also sounds sustainable you know i was thinking about the early days of our industry and like just everybody at work six days a week 12 hours right. a day 14 hour days it led to a lot of incredible outcomes so i don't think anybody who does it is making a mistake necessarily but it can break people it it, it can exclude certain people from the team that might be high performers so it's really the job of management to just figure out a cadence it sounds like you found the cadence that works for you sounds kind of exciting actually it's working right now and we're having a great time so yeah if any of your listeners want to come and uh yeah. get stuck in we're having a great time <laughs> 
I mean, you, that's the other thing is people have choice amongst elite folks. You got to make it fun and, and it's got to be purpose, right? And, and it sounds like a lot of fun to go to these remote locations and do a week. So, all right, listen, great job. Uh, look forward to reading the book. Uh, comes out on September 5th. Everybody pre-order it. Tell me the name one more time of the book. Uh, it's The Coming Wave. The Coming Wave. So go look for that on Amazon or Audible and pre-order right now. If you hear my voice, please pre-order. So he gets that big first week bump. You need a uh, 10,000 in order to make the New York Times bestseller list. That's and true. I'll see you all next week on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.